Our second panel is titled The Indigenous Pacific and will be moderated by Professor Dean Itsuji Saranilio, who is an assistant professor, but we hope for not much longer, like moving on up. Um, assistant professor, we'll, mm, <laughs> but fingers crossed, I'm not saying anything, who is um, assistant professor in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis at NYU, where he's also uh, currently the director of undergraduate studies. And his book um, titled Unsustainable Empire, Alternative Histories of Hawaii Statehood um, is out any minute now with uh, Duke University Press. And I'm also delighted to inform you that the Institute will be hosting a book party for Dean on December 5th. So we encourage you, I think it's, is that our final event for the semester as well? Yeah, so it's our final event for the semester um, D on Wednesday, December 5th. Um, so please check our calendar for more details. And welcome, Dina. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Um, so uh, we are very fortunate uh, to have two amazing speakers uh, with us today. Um, and the session is titled uh, The Indigenous Pacific, but I just want to um, make a note that what is being spoken about is itself uh, directly relevant to where we are today. And so that we are on indigenous lands, we are on uh, the, the lands of the Lenape people. The Lenape people were themselves uh, displaced in the 18th century uh, to parts of Oklahoma. Um, through Pennsylvania to Ontario. Um, and a lot of the things that we're gonna be talking about today are themselves a kind of structure that uh, reaches the Pacific, um, but is itself not anomalous to the Pacific. It is absolutely, it will help us to understand where we are today. So just as an example, um, Wall Street was itself an actual apartheid wall that was constructed uh, by enslaved African labor as a means of uh, keeping out the Lenape peoples from Dutch settlements. And that itself emerges as a global capitalist structure, right? And so what we are talking about, just to kind of quote Patrick Wolf, right? This is itself invasion is a structure, not an event. And so I just want to make that um, sort of known from the beginning. And so um, we're very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Jamaica Heolimele Ikalani Osorio, uh, who is a Kanakamali Wahine poet, activist, scholar, born and raised in Palolo Valley to parents Jonathan and Mary Osorio. Osorio earned her PhD in English and Hawaiian literature with the completion of her dissertation entitled Remembering, re in, uh, in parentheticals, Upena of Intimacies, a Kanakamali Mo'olelo Beyond Queer Theory. Currently, Osorio is a Ford dissertation fellow and is an assistant professor of indigenous and native Hawaiian politics at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Osorio is a three-time national poetry champion poetry mentor and a published author. I also used um, Hilde's poetry in a lot of my lectures. It's just, uh, it's just um, beautiful poetry that helps you to, to, to think broadly about time in, in numerous kinds of ways. Um, uh, and um, she is a proud past Kayapuni student, Ford Fellow, and a graduate Kamehameha Schools, Stanford University, and here, uh, NYU. And then uh, after Hilde, uh Christine Titano de Lyle, uh, will speak, uh, who is an assistant professor of American Indian Studies at the University of Minnesota. Uh, Tina's research and uh, teaching interests focus on the intersections of colonialism, militarism, gender, and indigeneity in the Pacific Islands. She is currently completing a book on the history of Chamorro nurse midwives and teachers in Guam under U.S. colonialism and the work of American Navy wives. Delal's research also examines the power relations between native peoples and museums. She has worked with Chicago, Chicago's Field Museum on the display and use of a traditional 19th century Maori meeting house and was involved in initial planning of a new museum in her home island of Guam. She is currently examining indigenous decolonization and sovereignty movements in relation to museums, national parks, and national monuments in Micronesia. So um, please join me in welcoming our speakers and I'll turn it over to uh, Hilde. O ma alo nani nui ke kāne o lono kau maka hika vihine no pula wa hāne o i mai kalani he kāne o i mai kalani he kāne o ke ko kalani ko vihine no pula wa hāne o i o pa olu hika hino nani he kāne o pa olu hika hino nani he kāne o pipi vai vai ole vihine no pula wa hāne o i o Charles Moses kamakuvo ole o kumemehe kāne 
O heina loa ke kāne o ni au ka wahine, noho pula o ahānau ia o naka oka he wahine. O naka oka ka wahine o kalua i honolulu ke kāne, noho pula o ahānau ia o ka pahu he wahine. O ka pahu ka wahine o kua ke kāne, noho pula o ahānau ia o Daisy ke ali i ai awa awa he wahine. O Daisy ke ali i ai awa awa ka wahine o Charles Moses ka makawa ole o ka meme ke kāne, noho pula o ahānau ia o Eliza le aloha ka makawa ole he wahine. O Eliza le aloha ka makawa ole he wahine o Emil Montero o Zara ke kāne, noho pula o ahānau ia o Elroy Thomas e aloha o Zara he kāne. O Elroy Thomas e aloha o Zara ke kāne, o Clara ke ku ule e ka wahine, noho pula o ahānau ia o Jonathan ke ka makawa ole o Zara he kāne. O Jonathan Kay, ka maka wo'ole o Zora ke kāne, o Mary Carol Dunn, ka wahine, noho pula wa ahānau ia o Jamaica, he oli mali kalani o Zora o he wahine, do not forget us, mai poina. Aloha mai kākou. Let's try again. Aloha mai kākou. Oh, thank you. So great. You can call my mali hini. My name is Jamaica, or he oli, or he oli mali kalani o Zora o. I begin with my mo'oku au hau, my genealogy, for a few reasons. One, to... Uh, bring me into this space to acknowledge the Lenape people who are indigenous to this land and to bring my kupuna with me and to introduce myself to them in this place. And when I'd say their names, I bring the Aina, the land that they come from, from Havi and Kohala, traveling down the Hamakua coast into Hilo, Keokaha, and then eventually uh, Honolulu, Oahu, where I was born and raised by my parents. Um, I come from a family of storytellers. Um, and I'm a student of stories, a student of mo'olelo, that, that is the word we use um, in Hawaiian to talk about stories and histories. Uh, I am not a legal scholar, uh, so I am not going to talk about um, the legal apparatus that brought Hawaii to be under the control, or under the illusion of the control of the United States. Instead, I'm going to talk about mo'olelo and share some mo'olelo with you folks. Um, as a scholar, I focus in particular on uh, Mo'olelo and what it has to teach us about the largest and most challenging obstacles we face today. Uh, in particular, I spend most of my time immersed in Mo'olelo that celebrate the excellentness, leadership, and the aloha of Kanaka Maoli wanting for each other, their kane, their wahine, their men, their women, their families, their communities, and most importantly, their aina, that which feeds them their lands. My work focuses on the political imperative of pilina relatedness uh, and its effects of dismembering pilina through colonialism, occupation, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to use a lot of Hawaiian words today. Uh, there's going to be a lot of Hawaiian words in the PowerPoint. I will define some of them. I will not define many of them. Uh, but hopefully, by the end, we kind of have a mo'olelo we've shared together, and we can share some understanding on why, uh, why this is important. Um, I also want to say that most of this research and what I do looks at a particular mo'olelo, the mo'olelo of Hi'iaka Ikapolio Pele. And Hi'iaka Ikapolio Pele is the story of the youngest sister of Pele, who was the goddess of the volcano. So if you're paying uh, attention to the news in the last year or so, you know that Pele has been creating new land in Hawaii. Uh, and that's what Pele does, is she creates new land. But her younger sister, the story is of her younger sister going from Hawaii Island, which is like, if this is the West Coast, right? Hawaii Island is here and Kauai's up here. She goes from Hawaii Island to Kauai to fetch a lover for her sisters and returns. And there's all kinds of obstacles she's faced with. Uh, but the story is a story of relatedness and pilina and creation. Um, and basically all the conclusions I come to um, that I'll share with you today come from this particular mo'olalo. Uh, like I said, I focus on this idea called pilina and the way it's disembodiment, uh, the disembodiment between our intimacy between each other is related to our disembodiment of our pilina with our land. Uh, and this is, that itself is not a huge or new idea in terms of uh, Native American or indigenous studies or indigenous queer theory. We, we're kind of at this point where we're talking about that if we're gonna reckon with the idea of nation building and decolonization, we need to reckon with the decolonization of our own bodies and our own relationships. My work in particular takes that idea and looks specifically at a Hawaiian archive and the specificity of our own archive to show us what that might look like um, in the hopes that other indigenous folks will use this methodology with their own archives and using their own language to uncover uh, indigenous practices of intimacy. Um, so today, what I'm actually going to present comes from the final chapter of, of my dissertation uh, in where I look at two 
to specific kinds of relationships and how understanding what they actually mean rather than what they've been appropriated to mean in Hawaii can actually help us unsettle um, settler colonialism in Hawaii. Um, so I'm gonna begin uh, I'm going to begin with a story because I'm going to talk about relationships to people and to places, to ideas and to communities. And I'm thinking about how this can also unsettle our own ideas about citizenship because citizenship itself is also a relationship. Uh, and what makes citizenship necessary? Uh, perhaps that we don't practice alternative ways of relating to lands and to people. Uh, so here might be a few. Um, I was born and raised in the Ahupua of Waikiki. And Ahupua is just a district. Um, and as a child, my family would spend our weekends rolling in the shore break at Kaimana Beach Park. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever been to Waikiki or Oahu, or you've seen a picture of Hawaii. Okay, so you know, you have something in your imagination of what Hawaii looks like. Um, good. Uh, it might be hard to imagine, but even in the early 90s when I was growing up, uh, parts of Waikiki were still ruled by Kanaka Maoli, Native Hawaiians and local families. Uh, this was before the city and county of Honolulu was bringing in manufactured sand by the truckloads to beef up a shoreline that was eroding into the sea because of its overdevelopment. This was before the metered stalls running along Kapi'olani Park, long before the state of Hawaii was expecting nearly 9 million visitors a year and insisted, uh, instated a sit and lie ban that specifically targeted crim and criminalized Hawaii's poorest for simply existing and being an eyesore to its favorite commodity, Waikiki Beach. In 27 years, the transformation of Waikiki has been tremendous. I'm 28. Um, its shoreline and those who frequent it are nearly unrecognizable to me. Kanaka Maoli, Native Hawaiians, and local families who navigate between the hordes of visitors through the chalky manufactured sand are now the exception rather than the expectation. And as we come to the shoreline less and less, it is not just Waikiki that becomes less recognizable to us. We too become foreign to her. Kaimana is a place that is intimately entwined with my relationship to my family. It is where I learned to swim in the ocean. It is where I almost drowned as a child when I decided to disobey my mother, where my brother and I conquered our fear of heights when we jumped off the natatorium wall and the lifeguard tower together, where I taught my sisters to bodyboard quite unsuccessfully. It is where we celebrate birthdays, adoptions, and bid farewell to lifelong friends. But I do not go to Kaimana often anymore. In fact, I only go there when my mother or father insist on my attendance at a particular family gathering. The beach itself is uncomfortable. The manufactured sand clings to the skin in an unnatural way. The shoreline is crowded with American, European, and Japanese and Chinese tourists. The parking lots are hostile. So when I come to Kaimana, I am overcome with the feeling that I do not belong. As a Kanaka Maoli, a native Hawaiian, born and raised in the Ahupua of Waikiki, this is not only sad saddening, but incredibly troubling to me. By historical standards, being a kama'aina, this is one of the relationships I'll talk about today, to this shoreline was a kuleana given to me by birth. A kuleana I would have to work to continue to uphold, but still a kuleana I had every right and responsibility to practice. Today that practice is obstructed by hotels, parking tolls, and massive crowds of malihini. And in some ways these obstructions have also impacted my relationship to my family. Um, and to a larger extent to my lahui, my community, and my nation. I tell this story as an introduction to demonstrate my kuleana, my responsibility to the place of Hawaii, um, however currently disturbed by settler colonialism and the continued occupation of my homeland by the United States. Um, and so I need to talk about this idea, kuleana. In my dissertation, I lay out a map um, a metaphor for understanding relationships. I use the upena, a fishing net, as an image of how Native Hawaiian relationships work pre-missionary influence. Uh, and essentially, I make two main conclusions. The first is that Hawaiians have a vast diversity of kinds of relationships we practice that do not at all fit within the model or the institution of marriage. And what happens when missionaries arrive in 1820 with their wives, because um, they all had to have wives, is they basically tried to throw all, uh, culturally at least, they, they tried to throw all the ways we related to each other through this like door called marriage. And the ones that didn't fit got forgotten or we stopped talking about them or they become savage. And the ones that kind of fit got retranslated through the institution of marriage. Um, so you see this in our dictionaries when you look up words like kan and wahine, which literally just means like man or woman, they become wife and husband. Um, 
or words like kaikoeke become like sister-in-law or brother-in-law, how we're retrans, our pilina to each other is transformed through the institution of marriage. So one, the supeno represents a vast uh, possibility outside of that. But beyond just being diverse, it also represents a different way of approaching relationships, one of uh, interconnectedness that works in ways different than the individual nature of a marriage or other civilized relationships in that we take on relationships communally. So if I had a, con well, if I had a wahine, um, a beloved woman, not a wife, um, and you and I were close friends, you might also refer to her as your wahine. Um, and in fact, you could have an intimate relationship. Well, you do, even if you're not having sex with her, there is some kind of intimacy shared between you. And what happens in that, that way of understanding our relationships, and we see this in the mo'olalo, that the possibility for pleasure, but also kuleana, this word I'll talk about, is exponentially compounded. Um, and so at the root of all relationships in a Hawaiian sense is this idea of kuleana. Um, and most people who are familiar with Hawaiian language will, re will define kuleana as responsibility, but it is also a privilege. Some might say a right. Pukui defines it, right, privilege, concern, responsibility, property, estate, title, claim, and ownership. Uh, what's concerning about even Pukui's definition here is we're also being our understanding of responsibility is being translated through the institution of, um, well, through real estate, through commerce, through capitalism, right? We're transforming the way that we even relate to our land through the simple way uh, that our language is transformed. So one of the things the dissertation actually does is it takes a look at translation theory and how that like just creates all kinds of immediate issues in accessing the text and what it has to teach us. Um, what's interesting about Pukui is that she also uses this phrase, o hina komako kuleana aole o kekane. We are related through hina, not through the husband. Um, she is showing us that kuleana is this essential thing that comes with pilina, because she is here talking about a specific pilina. But we also just have to be really careful of the associations she brings with us through land ownership uh, and even rights ideologies. As a student, I guess it's not in here. As a student of stories, I decide that if I want to learn more about Kuleana, I got to look to Mo'olalo themselves. And so Sarah Nakoa um, writes an incredible book called Le Momio Eva. It's a really short text. It's in Hawaiian. And she is a kama'aina. We'll talk about that term in a bit of Eva. And the way she describes Kuleana, she says, No uiho uoloa he Kuleana yetwe kama ilio aku kia pupu no ko'u wahi i ke ana, ko'u la vai apu ana, a me ko'u ai ana ina meo ko'u wa kamali'i. She's talking about in the beginning of her text why she has the kuleana to talk about her subject matter. And the way she demonstrates her kuleana, she says, um, I have seen these shells, these pupu. I have, eat, I have eaten them. I have fished them. Yeah, sorry, I've fished them, I've eaten them, and I've done so since the time that I was small. What she tells us, basically, is that to have kulean over something is to have a long-standing, lifetime relationship with it, to be fed by it, and to feed it as well, so it's reciprocal. That's the fishing, of course. Um, and then, of course, she's seen it with her own two eyes. It is not something she read about, makahanaka ike. She's learned through experience. This, of course, allows us to know that... Um, Sarah Nakoa can write this book about Eva not because she owns property in Eva, but because she has this very specific pilina to Eva that comes with a kuleana. When we look um, at kuleana in Hi'iaka Mo'olalo, the Mo'olalo that I study, there are, yeah, okay, I just want to make sure, sorry. Um, there are a few ways this comes about. One, Hi'iaka shows us kind of the risk of having no kuleana to a place. She says to her older sister, when her sister ends up killing her lover, they have this, the story's not as important to this presentation, but her sister kills her lover and Hiyaka's enraged. And she, she basically says, I went off to this place where I had no kuleana to. I risked myself for you to these places that I had no pilina to. Um, and here you've gone and you've killed, killed my wahine and killed our kane. Um, we see in that the, the great sacrifice it takes when you step away from your own kuleana. 
um, and Hiiaka's own recognition of being out of place. Um, we also learned from Hiiaka that you can maintain a kulana to a particular place even if you are displaced or moved. She says, um, O hoi la o a muli o kau kauaha e a nae o leo e noho ana me oe, o ko ukule ana noho o no nae no kalua o kiloea a pela, hoea i lalo me hani, me o uno ia. So she's talking about whether or not she will stay, um, stay on kauai with her kane, and what she says is, um, you've given me this like great invitation and I will, I will stay for some time, but my kule ana remains back in kilauea to the place that I'm a kupa of, that I've developed this relationship to. Um, and the more you dig into the hi'iaka mo'olalo, the more you see a greater shape of what kuleana looks like, how it's practiced, and what happens when you don't practice it effectively. Uh, essentially, um, you could be killed. That's how most mo'olalo work. Um, <laughs> for those of us, you know, um, not so familiar with Hawaiian language and these stories, a really great way to think about kuleana is to think about positionality. Okay, kuleana is both positionally and relationally articulated, so it changes depending on who I'm around and what I am around. So in Hawaii, I am an indigenous, native Hawaiian, queer, scholar, poet, artist, all kinds of things, right? And so my particular kulana is very specific in Hawaii, and even more specific in different parts of Hawaii, where I grew up in Hawaii versus the west side of Oahu or other islands that will change. In the same way that when I come here, I am still indigenous to Hawaii, but I am not an indigenous person of this place, right? So my kuleana to this place, when I will speak, how I will speak, if I should speak or act, is transformed. Um, Another thing, so that's, that's one way, like if we're trying to understand kuleana better, if you have a strong grasp with positionality, that might be a helpful way. And I think, too, positionality also comes with certain rights and privileges. Um, kuleana also teaches us to be weary of uh, rights, ideologies. Um, the best person who really talks about this, even though she doesn't use the language of kuleana, is Honani K. Trask uh, in her book, From a Native Daughter. Um, and, and essentially, kuleana asks us to understand the interlocking authority of accountability to each other um, and what kind of lessons we share with ourselves and with our settlers and visitors. Um, not understanding positionality and relationality in Hawaii creates huge problems for everyone with regards to kuleana representation and decision making. While governing institutions in Hawaii are made up largely by malihini, um, they have the power to make decisions without the pilina, the relationship to the places and people that those decisions most immediately impact. Um, and therein lies the main problem of the state of Hawaii, as I will say. Um, okay, so why does this matter? Well, like I said before, all pilina come with kuleana. Uh, and I could list off dozens of pilina for you folks today to show you how amazing Hawaiians are, but instead I'm gonna focus on two. One is malihini and one is kama'aina, and I'm gonna to try to focus on them without making them a binary, because that would kind of undo the work I'm trying to do in the dissertation. <laughs> um, but just for the sake of time and simplicity, we're gonna talk about two. So malihini in the dictionary is defined as stranger, foreigner, newcomer, tourist, guest, mm -hmm. company, so and so and so forth. We have three main dictionaries, so Andrew defines it as to be or live as a stranger, a stranger, a non-resident, transient person, a person from another place. Um, importantly, malihini is a relationship. It is not an identity, okay? So one of the most important things that my work does, especially in talking about um, queer desire and intimacy, is to focus on these things as relationships. They are not identities. Um, and if people wanna ask questions about that later, we can talk about it, because that is in of interest to me, but we don't have much time. Um, on the other relationship we're talking about, of course, is kama'aina, defined by pukui as native born, one born of a place, host, native plant. Uh, Andrews calls this a child of the land, a native born of any place. And then Parker, the present residence in a place, a citizen, interesting, especially one of long standing. Um, so when we begin and talk about malihini, in Hawaii today, Parker's definition uh, comes closest, the f f 
the last one, comes closest to reflecting how Kama'aina has been perverted, exploited, and commodified into a consumer reward system, offering Kama'aina or locals, by this definition, certain rights and privileges. Do you guys watch South Park? Yeah, the Hawaiian, what is it? The Hawaiian rewards card or Mahalo rewards card? Okay, the reason that's so funny is because you can go to places in Hawaii and say you're Kama'aina and you get a discount. If you live in Hawaii, you get discounts for being Kama'aina or military. That's basically it. I go, when people ask me if I'm military, I say, oh, do you have a Hawaiian discount? They all like feel really uncomfortable. Um, anyway. Um, so Kama'aina has been appropriated by the state of Hawaii to mean local. Anyone with a Hawaii uh, zip code or a Hawaii state ID, um, here the state decides if you're Kama'aina. Um, and we have to be cautious of, and mindful of how Kama'aina as a concept in this way is stripped of its practice of kuleana and pilina in ways that do and can maintain the settler state, right? It basically flattens the difference between locals and indigenous by basically saying there are tourists and then there are local people and there's, there's no more indigenous claim to this line, right? That's like textbook settler colonialism. We all know this. Um, and so instead, this purposeful and insidious translation of malihini and kama'aina into an identity void of kuleana erases the specific intimacies that traditionally mark one's relationship, replacing them with capitalism as the defining matrix for one's pilina to place. How sad. Um, this is the same thing that happens when we start uh, doing land ownership in Hawaii, right? It changes our relationship to place and to each other. Um, and then of course it becomes the justification for settlers to physically displace kanaka. I like to think of kama'aina when we read our mo'olelo, instead of just locals as the ones who remember. In Hi'iaka Mo'olelo, we learn that Kama'aina are the people who know the important information about land. Hi'iaka becomes a Kama'aina of Kauai because she can name the winds and rains of those places. Hawaiians have names for all our winds and rains. We're wonderful people. Um, <laughs> right? At one point, Mo'o, these large lizards who are not friends with Hi'iaka, who are actually born and raised on Kauai, they challenge her kama'aina -ness. They say, if you should offer up all the winds from Nihoa to this place, then you would be the kama'aina of our island and we would be the malihini. We see here that even living in a place for a long time is not enough to say you're a kama'aina. You need to practice that relationship. Mm -hmm. um, here comes in this idea of ho'opapa, the challenge. Kama'aina is always something that can be challenged. You can't just say I'm a kama'aina and not be ready to answer the call, like prove it, right? Show your stuff. And then, of course, we talked about this. It's a relationship um, and not an identity. So I don't have a slide for this, of course, because I wrote this part on the plane. Um, but we have a Hawaiian olelo no eo, a poetic and prophetic setting, a setting, saying, that says, ho'okahi no lao kamalihini. It means a visitor for only a day. Um, it's something that comes to characterize the way we move through place, right? Because Hawaiians were an exploratory people. So we did move through place, but we understood that our kuleana changed as we did so. Um, but this idea, you were only a visitor for a day, um, totally rejects the settler state's preference and demand that Hawaii should always be on call for visitor entertainment and hospitality, right? This practice, which puts malihini, visitors, in the powerful role of buyers and kanaka, Kama'aina as sellers sustains the powerful settler state, the power of the settler state by dehumanizing Kanakamaoli bodies and culture. <coughs> our mo'olelo, our stories, can show us what deservedly happens to Malihini who overstay their welcome by not putting in the work to develop a more respectful pilina to place and to people. What's really important here is that both Kama'aina and Malihini are not just relationships to place, they're relationships to the people of those places as well. So what we learn in all pilina is that we're constantly creating and maintaining a relationship to people through place, that they come together. Um, essentially, the argument here is that being a tourist is easy, and even Hawaiians and long-standing residents of Hawaii can be tourists, can be malihini, if they don't practice kama'aina in the way that we learn in our mo'olelo. Um, and that the work is actually, the important work is to, the, the uh, what's the word? The call is to do the important work of becoming Kama'aina, right? To learn of those places, to learn the stories, to learn the names of those places, to stop calling uh, uh, Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor, but instead call 
wow, I forgot, Pu'ulo, um, to not call Sandy Beach, Sandy Beach, but to call it Avava Malu, like these small but important ways of remapping our home as Hawaiian, um, is kind of that first and rewarding work that will transform our communities and expand our capacities to help heal us as a community. Uh, in the language of indigenous studies, this is the work of identifying and practicing settler responsibility. Um, or I would probably more appropriately call it um, kuleana malihini. If settler colonialism is a structure rather than an event, then demanding that systems must begin with unpack, uh, dismantling that system must begin with unpacking and understanding our diverse kuleana ta'aina to each other, moving through our time as malihini in an appropriate fashion before becoming kama'aina to places and communities. And these are difficult questions. And because it's always up for challenge, it is vulnerable work. It is vulnerable work to become a kama'aina, but transformation takes vulnerability. Um, the last few things I will say is that um, as what's interesting to me about this collection of panels and its focus on 1898 um, and Hawaii in particular in that is that it centers, of course, this rupture of the annexation that never happened. Um, and when we focus on the annexation that never happens, often the alternative is the kingdom of Hawaii. Um, and ultimately what my work really tries to push is this idea that the kingdom is but one articulation of governance in Hawaii, and rather our mo'olalo show countless alternatives of governance in Hawaii. And, and it's not that I'm not a kingdom person, it's just I'm not only a kingdom person. Um, and in fact, most kingdom people are, are not kingdom people, they're kingdom men, um, which poses, because they're not, yet ready to reckon with the questions of gender and sexuality and relationship. Um, so as we look beyond citizens, citizenship, I also want us to push a little bit beyond the nation state and even the kingdom as something that articulates another kind of nation state and to think what, what good can come from just going back to the root of how we relate to each other and how we create community and how our mo'olalo and the way that they create ohana and family show us a, teach us about governance because we know that nation building um, and empire building in Hawaii and in other places came with family building, right? So if when we undo that family building and see what's under it, we might also learn a lot, not might, we will learn a lot about nation building, aloha aina in Hawaiian perhaps, on our own standards. Um, I don't really have much more time, so I will end by saying that what these mo'olalo teach us is that Kanaka Maoli not only want to wish, live sustainable and equi equitable and fulfilling lives in relationship to each other in our lands, but we want to be known and loved by our lands as well. Hi'iaka reminds us that we long not to be forgotten or left behind. And I didn't share a part of that mo'olalo, but if we have time together at other times in our lives, I would love to tell you about the ways Hi'iaka called out to these different places she passed through and asked them not to forget her. Um, this is a pilina that comes with aloha aina. Like other relationships, kama aina is reciprocal. Therefore, this famous off-sited aspect of hi'iaka mo'olalo reveals that our aina in its own way remembers how we aloha honor or dismiss her. Like our bodies, our aina carry intergener intergenerational aloha and trauma. So if we want to be remembered by Waikiki, by Waiahole, by Waikane, by Kailua, ka'ohao, then we need to remember these places back. And if I do not want to be refused or forgotten, then I must not refuse Waikiki. If we seek to reclaim our kuleana to call this place home, or this place, I think of New York is probably a fantastic example, the way this place has been constantly remapped and remapped and remapped and remapped. Um, we have a kuleana to learn about all, not just all those different maps, but what lies under those scars. <laughs> their mo'olalo, their histories, their secession of names. Um, we have to fight to remember these places as they still are beneath the scars of their development, beyond the ways they have been pimped out for economic opportunity. In my own life, this means returning to Waikiki with my ohana. I will recover and sing the old melodies of my kupuna, shower Waikiki shoreline with our voices. These simple acts of resurgence are especially important in those places that the fake state of Hawaii um, and the city and county have made abundantly clear that Kanaka are not welcome except on government terms. Part of our trauma of being displaced and removed from Waikiki and other aina is our awareness that they have been left alone with strangers, transformed and forgotten. To again practice our pilina, we must offer what we know best, our mo'olalo and our music, 
back to these places and we must say, Aole makoi puina ya oi, we will not forget or refuse you again. Mahalo. Finanena Malagutu, Parabai, who for Tau Tau, E Tautonic, Guinea, Estina Lugar, E Tautau Lenape, Sidus Masi, Dunkel and Sidus Masi. And thank you also to the organizers, to Professor Cristo Parik uh, for the invitation. And um, I'm very honored to be here. And to Amita Mangani for your help for, uh, for getting me here <laughs> in one piece. In anticipation of 2021 and then quincentennial of the first circumnavigation of the Earth, plans are already underway for Spain to host a number of international commemorative events, including a retracing of Ferdinand Magellan's expedition to find a westward route to the Spice Islands. To this end, Spain's officials are coordinating with the United States government for the Spanish Navy to make a stopover in Guam. Making sure Guam has a say in these so-called commemorations, Vice Speaker Therese Terlahi of the Guam Legislature established a commission to ensure indigenous Chamorro perspectives are given a voice, and that the local community has an opportunity to share its unique, quote unquote, view of the first encounter. Of this first encounter on March 6, 1521, in what was the first encounter between native Pacific Islanders and Europeans, as recorded by Europeans, the Chamorros of Guam are said to have pilfered iron and a skiff, a small boat, off of Magellan's ship. This act incurred the wrath of the Admiral, who ordered a landing party to burn down the nearest village, Spanish the Spanish killed several Chamorros they encountered along the way and for the next three days wreaked havid, havoc and violence and then after took more food for the ships. Of these events, in particular, the stealing of a skiff, which uh, some interpret as chanchuli in Chamorro, it's, a, it's, a, it's seen as a gift or of exchange or reciprocity. After all, Chamorros did provide Magellan as, and his starving, scurvy-ridden crew after being out in sea for three months with food and water. Magellan's scribe Antonio Pigafetta bequeathed the name Isla de los Ladrones, the island of thieves, to the Marianas. In the 300 years that followed, Spain continued to unleash its litany of violence, epidemics, religious conversion, backed by military conquest, the reconfiguration of native lands and bodies, the Chamorro-Spanish Wars, which were prompted by the 1672 killing of the Spanish Jesuit priest Diego Luis de San Vitoris by the Chamorro chief Matapang from Tomhom. San Vitoris established the first mission in the Pacific Islands in Guam in 1668, and a year later, the Colegio de San Juan de Letron, and later, the Escuela de Niñas, a, a, uh, the re religious instruction um, for, for girls that was on the other end in the capital city of Hagania. This legacy following 1521, uh, with this legacy following 1521, it's no wonder my colleague in Minnesota, Vince Diaz, a Ponapean Filipino born and raised in Guam, who is sure, who says he is sure the quincentennial will include a replica of one of Magellan's ships has been rallying fellow seafarers from across the Pacific, canoe navigators from Aotearoa, New Zealand, the Philippines, and Taiwan, canoe builders from US, the, the US Pacific Northwest tribes and the Great Lakes region, to quote unquote, ready our fleets. <laughs> because sure as another replica, European vessel comes sailing into Guam waters to commemorate the last 500 years of European and Asian colonialism and to celebrate Magellan's circumnavigation of the globe in 1521. We should also have a fleet of indigenous canoes ready to meet in order to ensure that the next 500 years get off to a better start. In Diaz's, word, in Diaz's words, if the Chamorros of 500 years ago took a skiff 
The slogan 500 years later and for the next 500 years might well be something like, fuck the skiff, we are taking the whole damn ship. Yes. <laughs> In a similar inverting or subversive inverting of the events of 1521, but this time in the context of U.S. imperialism and the controversial U.S. military buildup in Guam, Chamorro envir uh, environmental activist Sabina Perez dubs the U.S. Ladrones de las, de las Islas, thieves of islands. In a 2008 publication of Women for Genuine Security, a name that itself inverts meanings of security and discourses of national and military security. And in a modern day hurling of, uh, and we might look at this as a modern day hurling of sling stones, spears, and epithets. And this is what Chamorros did on the day in 1521. As the real thieves of Magellan's expedition sailed into the sunset, or so they thought, because their next stopover would be in the Philippines. And we all know what happened to Magellan in the Philippines. Paris retraces the legacy of U.S. military land theft in Guam. For my presentation today, I explore these indigenous inversions and subversions around land theft as part of a broader interest in the intersections of indigeneity, gender, and sexuality in the histories and cultural politics of U.S. empire, colonialism, and military, uh, militarism in the Pacific Islands, and the emergence of indigenous feminisms, and what I call a Chamorro placental politics. The inspiration and insight for an indigenous Chamorro placental politics comes directly from how pre-World War II Chamorro midwives, the Patera, in defiance of pre-war US naval colonial orders to discard or burn it, continued to bury the pares, the placenta, because as they maintained, uh, they maintained this practice kept children out of harm's way and kept them close to home. The Patera's stewarding of Chamorro lands and bodies, their insistence on this protective measure of inafalt maulik, a Chamorro code of values based on interdependence and balance, which literally means to make good which has deep sim Chamorro symbolic and cultural meanings connecting notions and expectations of self in relation to land and community in a system of uh, reciprocal kinship relations and obligations. This has important impl implications for contemporary indigenous land and self-determination struggles in Guam, especially against a new round of US militarization but also more broadly for indigenous sovereignty and cultural resurgence. I look specifically at Chamorro women's activism around Litexan, also known as Retidian, around which the military is currently constructing a marine live fire training range complex. My interest in women's struggles to protehi, protect Litexan, is also part of a bigger decolonial project in my home island of Guam. One fourth of which is controlled by the US military, which today remains on the UN list of non self governing territories, and in which a robust indigenous sovereignty and independence movement is currently underway. A group that figures prominently here is Protei Latexen one of whose co-founding members is Sabina Paris, who does that inversion earlier that I talked about, uh, a descendant of one of the original landowning families. Um, I wanna share right now a, um, about a three minute clip of Paris's testimony at uh, one of the many public hearings on the US uh, military buildup. I just want to point out that that's, that might not seem like a big deal to give testimony. First of all, it, it requires a lot of work to try to put that in three minutes. But in Guam, highly patriotic, that is a big deal to speak openly against the military. It's tantamount to speaking against Chamorros, who, who have uh, who, many Chamorro families who are of military families, right? Located along Guam's northern 
rugged coast. Retidian was established in 1993 under the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This, despite public outcry and demonstrations by original Chamorro landowners. Following the U.S. defeat of Japan and U.S. reoccupation of Guam in 1944 and the subsequent Cold War buildup in Guam, the U.S. in 1963 condemned lands around Letegzen for use as a U.S. naval communications facility. In the early 1990s, during U.S. military downsizing, when 370 acres of Retidian lands were designated by the military as excess, and that always is mind-boggling to me, how the military declares excess lands, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in what then Guam dele delegate to Congress, Robert Underwood, called, quote unquote, a land grab in disguise, fought original Chamorro landowners in the name of public good and for the protection of endemic species, six of which were placed on a, a list in 1984. And this area was designated as the island's critical habitat for the remaining population of the Mariana fruit bat, Mariana kingfisher, the Mariana common moorhen and Mariana crow, as well as the blue banded king crow butterfly. So you're beginning to see these different layers or these neo forms of colonialism. In a new round of military buildup in which the US plans to transfer close to 5,000 American Marines, and those numbers are constantly shifting, and their dependence from Okinawa to Guam. DOD recently announced its plans to use roughly 700 acres of lands around Retidian, known as uh, Northwest Field or Tailalo, as a live fire training range complex, which would require designating Retidian, nearby Retidian, as a surface to danger zone and closing it off to the public for up to 39 weeks in the year. Despite the inevitable destruction, but as required through an EIS mitigation plan, the military insists it will continue to be a good steward of Guam's environment and natural and cultural resources, such as the ancestral burial grounds, the lati, the stone structures uh, that use, that upon which ch uh, early Chamorro homes sit. And uh, whenever you see a lati, you, just, you know that's where ancestors are buried. Destruction of medicinal plants, endemic plants and animals, excuse me, endemic um, and, and, and endemic animals and limestone forests. Adding yet another layer to the multiple and competing narratives of refuge, protection and sanctuary surrounding Retidian is the fact that it was also the site of an ancient Chamorro village dating back to 1500 BCE, whose clans, according to Spanish missionary accounts, harbored Chamorro rebel fighters during the 17th century Chamorro Spanish Wars. This really is about national parks and militarism going up against the indigenous sacred or the indigenous sacred taking on the power of this tandem thrust, a sacredness that we can glean from this poem. National Security Park, um, written by uh, an anonymous writer, uh, Molino, which in Chamorro means to grind. In the Commission on Decolonization's position paper for independence in 2000, independence task force members pointed to the new modes of, of American military colonialism. The poem, whose author goes by, by Molino, um, makes reference to Chamorro lands being stolen for th their strategic importance in the larger colonial and geopolitical space dignif uh, signified by dark clouds of war. The poem also makes specific reference to the new modes of U.S. empire in the form or guise of national parks, as suggested by the poem's title. What the poem also conveys is a deep and continued Chamorro sense of place. Latis stand tall despite and in spite of old and new military fences, both tangible under the military and intangible under the Department of Interior. Such assertions of Chamorro's sense of place and, and Chamorro stewardship figure prominently in the work of the late Anghet Santos um, and the um, activist, the Chamorro activist um, group um, known as Nashon Chamorro, the Chamorro Nation. Since the 1970s, many, Chamorro uh, many Chamorros and grassroots organizations have been involved in political, cultural, and land struggles, such as Parapara in Chamorro means stop the slap, 
the Organization for the Protection of Indigenous Rights, OPIR, and in Nashon Chamorro, the Chamorro Nation. Perhaps the image associated the most with contemporary grassroots environmental activism and Chamorro land rights is, is that of the late Angel Santos. And, and the image of him scaling a military fence in the early 1990s. So Santos was a, um, uh, an, an um, Air Force veteran turned activist or environmental, uh, environmentalist, and then he became elected as a senator. Uh, he was at the forefront of Chamorro land rights struggle for, um, and also for self-determination struggles and, and the return of ancestral lands. In yet another act of defiance in the early 1990s, this time of the local government, uh, or Gov Guam, Santos and Nashon Chamorro pro protested outside the governor's office and demanded that then Governor Joseph Atta implement the Chamorro Land Trust. Modeled after the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, the Chamorro Land Trust was a bill passed in 75 that provided applicants with the chance to lease for a dollar uh, a year up to one acre of government land for residential occupancy, 20 acres for farming and 40 acres for grazing. But this had never been um, implemented actually until 1993 and this is, and this is one of the, the forces behind getting that implemented. Last September, um, the Department of Justice sued GovGuam on the grounds that the Chamorro Land Trust Act discriminates. Um, and it said, you know, unlike Hawaiian home, home, home homesteads, uh, you know, this wasn't, this wasn't enacted by Congress. So it, it's, it's, uh, it discriminates. And Chamorros are currently fighting this right now. Chamorro attorney Oliver Verdalio, whose father actually fought the military back in the 1960s, when uh, the military wanted to, to use some of the family lands for a, mun a munitions wharf. He gives us, us an example, again, of this indigenous inversions against this legacy of US imperialism and land theft. And I highlight those in yellow. Um, you know, and I'll just give you a few examples because I might be down to like the last five minutes. Um, you know, where was DOJ Civil Rights Division when the people of Guam were, were uh, forced to surrender their lands to the US military after World War II? Um, where, where, where was DOJ's Civil Rights Division when the people of Guam were literally poisoned by the military's persistent use of toxic chemicals, including defoliants like Agent Orange, right? And he goes on to call out the military. I want to return um, to Prote Latexin, comprised predominantly of women, uh, Chamorro women and non-Chamorros, uh, but predominantly Chamorro women and uh, descendants of the original landowners of, of, of Latexin. I go back and forth between Latexin, that's a Chamorro name, which means a, a stirring place, and uh, Retidian. And the membership is becoming increasingly uh, youth-led. So this is an interesting one because uh, two of those members of Protehi ran for office and just earlier this month were elected uh, to serve as senators for the island. Uh, so they're celebrating here. Um, here's an image of uh, um, getting the petition out and getting um, recently retired uh, former dele Guam's delegate to Congress, Robert Underwood, to sign the petition against the use of um, Retidian for live fire training. And I should also mention that um, Underwood, when he was delegate of, he was also um, Guam's delegate at the time that, it, that, that Guam is trying to push the Commonwealth Bill that was uh, modeled after the Commonwealth of the, of the Northern Marianas. Uh, and that itself was modeled after Puerto Rico's Commonwealth status. I just wanted, so I really wanted to show um, uh, the way that it's, it's subverting, um, you know, the military's facts about the buildup, you know, we're going to protect the resources, uh, and then um, countering that. Um, I think what's also interesting about Protei Latekta, and unlike, say, Fuetsan Pamalawan, which is another activist women's organization, um, also, um, making a concerted effort around solidarity, uh, coalitional politics in this letter, showing support uh, with the protectors of Mon Mauna Kea. Creating this map that actually, uh, you know, this is a really important project of Prate Litekjan, 
showing uh, the space here before it was even um, critical wildlife habitat, right? Um, and one of the words that the military likes to use is previously disturbed, right? Well, how was it previously disturbed, right? I mean, that's what it doesn't answer. I want to play a clip, um, another public hearing. Here, Maria Hernandez, a descendant of one of the original Chamorro landing clans, confronts the military's highest in command, Rear Admiral Shoshona Chatfield, Commander Joint Region Marianas, and calls out the military's blatant and continued use of the term mitigation in asserting we don't want any more harm to our communities and demanding that the military take Retidian off the table, Hernandez not only changes the rules of engagement, she asserts an, an indigenous stewardship and cordage with the land willing to lay its life on the line and on the land. More than mere testimony, and this is not to, to dismiss the power in this modality, the testimony, which like the comments of, an, of the environmental impact statement become especially powerful tools in the context of Guam's ongoing colonialism. Hernandez's confronting of the Navy woman is an example of what feminist Aboriginal Australian scholar Aileen Morton Robinson calls talking up to the white woman. It also represents a new kind of indigenous articulation, one of radical resurgence and resistance, one that resists as Kanaka Maoli scholar Noilani Gujur Kaupua reminds us in the case of Manokea stewards and in the and in vintage Manawahini form, the label, of uh, the, the label of indigenous peoples as indigenous relics of the past rather than indigenous protectors of indigenous futurities. In closing, I end with a final indigenous feminist inversion an artwork by Pute Litecten Moneka Flores, one that transposes the sacred lati into self-determined fists, a calling, kahulu, rise up to the lati, to the manyaina, the ancestors that lie beneath it, and to their descendants and stewards in the here and now. This, I think, is, nothing, is really nothing, nothing less than thinking about the physical and psychological effects of witnessing military maneuvers over our placentas in the land. Sidus Masi. Thank you. Um, such thought provoking um, and powerful presentations. Um, I have a whole bunch of thoughts and ideas, and I feel like it's all over the place. And I'm just going to ask a few questions. Just, uh, just I guess it's more like prompts. I just want to hear you guys talk more. Um, and. I'm really sort of struck by the ways in which um, the both of you are, are framing your work within forms of relationality, pilina, um, or even planting placenta, mm -hmm. and um, the ways that settler colonialism or colonization is itself a kind of process that actually forces people uh, into relationship with mm -hmm. colonizers. Mm -hmm. It forces and it and it forces these peoples into a relationship in a, in an unequal, exploitative, genocidal way. But in doing that, it simultaneously assumes itself to be the more deserved power, right? <laughs> like it, like it's, it's, it's. I cannot tell you like how perverse or obscene it is for me to hear that um, the military is sort of describing themselves as as stewards of the land, or even like the language that the um, University of Hawaii is using in regard to a thirty meter telescope as right. stewards of, of of the land or of practicing a form of aloha. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess I just want to hear hear the both of you talk about um, about that kind of perversity and, and obscenities, and the ways in which um, organizers are are able to sort of flip the script on those kinds of processes or practices. Yeah, it's 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 mind boggling to say the least. Um, and and it's interesting that it perversion. I mean, um, Chamorro attorney. Uh, so Guam has a a. The, it's the Guam plebiscite and that image of the decolonization registry. Now, that's another thing. Just last year, so we had two, um, so we had the lawsuit against Chamorro right. around the Chamorro Land Trust, and, um, and, and it was, you know, saying, no, you, you, you know, you, you're not like Hawaii because, you know, it has to be, <laughs> it wasn't cre created by Congress. So that's a justification, right? Um, and then, and then in the case of the plebiscite, which is uh, a symbolic vote, 
right? This is not, it's not non-legally binding, right? Um, and, and, it's, um, and this is a good example now of how we have to really pull apart, right, colonialism and give a critique of settler colonialism because it's a, it's a, it's a holy white man who, uh, who's retired military living in Guam who sues um, because, because he can't vote in the Chamorro Registry, right? Um, Sounds familiar. And, mm -hmm. and so, the, the, so the attorney that was defending that, who wrote the, who wrote the, the, the case, right, who, uh, and defended it, uh, mm. called it a perversion because, mm. you know, the, the federal government turned around and said, uh, this is race-based when he, you know, really made it a good, what he did was base the, the um, identity on the, the 1950 Guam Organic DAC, right? Mm. And that was a, a U.S. federal apparatus that the United States unilaterally created, right? So it, 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 it uses that and invokes that, but then the U.S. turns around and says, no, you can't do that because that's discrimination, right? Mm. And so he called it a perversion, right? Mm. Um, but, but even in terms of the land, um, you know, the military says we're a steward, and then in building the live fire training range complex, complex it has to destruct, you know, several, um, you know, um, the limestone forest, and it turns around and says, well, we're gonna, you know, we have to do this, but we're gonna build back the limestone forest, right? Which we know has taken <laughs> several thousands of years, right? To, so, so it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's. I mean, but it's at the same time, it's like the ways in which tomorrow activists or, or Hawaiian activists are described generally in the public Mm. are as a kind of perversion. Like, it's like right, like Haunani K. Trask was always sort of described as using obscene languages, yeah, yeah. or, you know, right, like, or represented as obscene, but it's like, I, and I, I feel like there's something about the ways in which, um, because settler colonialism or indigenous politics makes settlers uncomfortable, mm. that that discomfort then gets read as, like, something that is an affront to them. But then if you haven't actually contended with colonialism, mm. if you haven't ever contended with that process of mm -hmm. exploitation or genocide, then why would you expect it to feel good when you finally actually contend with it, right? Right. And so like, so there's, I mean, it's just, I, I, I don't even know what I'm trying to say, except just like, it's fucking perverse, right? Like, this whole process, what, where we are in, what we're in is, it's, it's, um, yeah. it feels, yeah. yeah. Tina talking about this uh, race-based voting is making me also think, about other relationships that are important, right? So, so a lot of my work talks about the forgotten. So the whole idea of like remembering upena, like remembering these things, practicing them, fixing them, returning the dismembered, right? But I talk a lot about these forgotten pilina, and not that much about the pilina that replaced them, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and how oftentimes it's not even pilina but identities, right? So we shift from being this this collective of people intimately obsessed with Pilina. Um, to give an example, this is actually probably a pretty good example. So Hawaiian pronouns, we have all kinds of pronouns. None of them are gendered at all. Um, Hawaiians could care less what gender or sex you are when we're talking to you or about you. That's what our language says, at least. Um, instead, all of our pronouns are relationally articulated. So. When I'm talking, you can tell from the pronouns I'm using if you're included in my speech or if you're on the outside of it and how many of us are included. So I could say kako, so everyone here is included. Mm -hmm. Or I could say mako while I'm talking to you guys, so that's just us. Or I could say, oh, look, lako over there. And there's dozens of them, right? We're obsessed with our relationship to each other and we're obsessed with the way that that changes as we speak. What happens when that gets kind of perverted, whatever, um, it's a cool word. Um, and then we get pushed into these different identities and we get offered this thing called race. And now we're supposed to identify as a race rather than a collective with this shared ancestry that's related to land. And then, you know, we get pushed into a new relationship with governance through this legal system that is foreign to us. Um, these like very seemingly simple, often taken for granted structures that reorder our entire lives. Um, I'm just, I'm wondering in this moment, vulnerably in front of all of you, um, what, I think about this a lot when thinking about 
uh, you, you talked about some votes not being legally binding. I, th I think of the law as like a mo'olelo, mm -hmm. in the same way that I think of like Christianity as a mo'olelo, in the same way that I think of my work mm -hmm. coming from mo'olelo, that these are all just different stories and they all have their own imaginations and none of them, they're only as binding as our accountability makes them. So to me, like nothing is really legally binding in my own experience. I mean, we're, Hawaii is, acts as a state of the United States without no legal obligation to do so, right? So like even these are fictions that I think we need to think about and, and the power is in what we believe in. Um, so in that sense, those stories can actually be law. Right? Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. At, well, yeah, and they are. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I yes. mean, if we if we look uh, historically at Hawaii, the stories absolutely are. That's where our laws, laws, mm -hmm. our agreements mm -hmm. come from, right? Mm -hmm. Ke Kanawai Hoi, which is kind of touted as the first human human rights law in the world, uh, where Kamehameha says, uh, like, take care of the people, great and small. Let the elderly and the children and the weak lie in the streets without fear of harm, which goes again, like opposite of what the city and county practices with their sit and lie bans, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that's a mo it's a story that gives us that agreement. Um, and it's our relationship to stories that makes them binding. Yeah. It, it feels like, an, but it's also an open-ended story because what I love about the both of your presentations, but also the ways in which settler colonialism is actually theorized in the Pacific differently than how settler colonialism is theorized mm -hmm. here, is actually that it's an invitation to 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 operate differently. So like it. So in other words, it makes me think that Le the Leanne Simpson quote that the opposite of dispossession isn't possession. The mm -hmm. opposite of dispossession is connection, mm -hmm. right? And so she's thinking about it through Anishinaabeg language, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and in a in a similar kind of way, the work in in the Pacific around settler colonialism is going beyond a politics of blame and accusation. It's going beyond a blame of complicity, mm -hmm. and is actually opening us to a plurality of, po plurality of possibilities outside of the settler state, Yes. right? Like, and, and, yeah. and that is it actually to our benefit. Mm -hmm. It is to the benefit of non-native peoples to make those connections, yeah. to live in a Pono way. It is, to the, it is actually our historical moment demands it of us mm -hmm. because of climate mm -hmm. crisis, because mm -hmm. of militarization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there's a way in which that reciprocity is existent in a discourse, but, um, but it's never thought of as such, right? Mm -hmm, it's, yeah. it's always thought yeah. of as, well, then if sovereignty happens for Hawaiians, then it comes at the expense of non-Hawaiians. But actually, that's not at all the discourse. That's not at all the that's, mo'olelo. That's yeah, and it's not, the, yeah. for the majority of people living in Hawaii, it's not at all the truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, sovereignty in Hawaii, whatever we were to collectively decide what sovereignty and independence would look like, uh, would come at great benefit to the folks who are picketing in Waikiki for yes. a living wage, Absolutely. right? Um, there are there are elite few that will be severely negatively impacted by sovereignty. Um, there's not that many of them. They have a lot of resources, but there's actually not that many people who would be negatively impacted by sovereignty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. First, I wanted to thank you both for what you shared. Your presentations were super engaging. And I actually had the opportunity to go to Guahan earlier this year, and I just came back from a visit to Hawaii and got to um, actually, and I got to connect with people who are doing groundwork there. I'm a community organizer here. I live in Queens. And mm. I'm trying to figure out how to engage New York City-based folks to support groundwork that's happening on the Pacific Islands. Huh. Um, my heritage is Filipino. My parents migrated here from the Philippines before I was born. And, you know, we understand that our movements need to be led by the people who are most impacted by the harmful policies and practices. So. Yeah. I would love to hear what your call to action would be for everybody in this room and for me in particular, um, wanting to figure out how to have New York City-based Pacific Islanders lead this struggle, lead this fight. How can we do that and support the decolonization movements on Guahan, on the, on the Pacific Islands like Hawaii? I think um, um, uh, pressure, putting pressure to recognize Guam's right to self-determination for one. Mm. Um, and that's something that continues to be um, shut down by the United States uh, at the UN level. Um, and there's also the, the, the immediate um, devastation that's happening with the military. 
Um, mm -hmm. So connecting with, with folks there, like Protei Lutegzen, and um, Protei Lutegzen is also an organization that has been about not just protecting um, Lutegzen, but also um, political status, right? It, it, it knows that it wouldn't have to be dealing with these things it were, if it were not for Guam's political status as an unincorporated territory. Um, so those kind of issues. There's, there's debate around, you know, some of us don't think the answer is going to be whether that we get to vote for the president. Mm. Um, you know, that sort of plays into that neoliberal, you know, that, and, and that's, uh, we don't know that that's going to address, well, we, we know that that's not going to address. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me be more firm about that right now. <laughs> um, but um, you know, connecting with with uh, Nashon Chamorro, Protei, um, and other grassroots organizations, um, and to put the word out. You know, putting pressure on 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 senators, representatives, mm -hmm. uh, to sp to support when that issue comes up. Right, and and also uh, putting pressure at the UN level when the issue of uh, you know getting Guam to finally exercise its right to well, you know right right, but mm -hmm. um, for starters, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, that's just the beginning. Thank you. We have to connect after. Let me get your name and number. <laughs> um, that's a fantastic question. I I myself. I'm very careful to not identify as an organizer because I think um, organizers are, are highly talented and tired mm -hmm. people uh, who often happen to be my friends um, and I just follow them around. Um, so rather than, and, and I think, I can think of all these people who would have a great answer to your question. I think the best thing I can say in terms of supporting the work that's happening in, in Hawaii is to I think one of the powerful things about Hawaii is, is the place we take up in people's imagination. Um, it, it, it saturates especially the American imagination and that image is so powerful um, and so transformative and, it, and unfortunately uh, negatively transformative to the experiences of people living in Hawaii. And I think that the first and easiest thing we can do is to start to unwork that in our own communities. Um, and that also comes and I think supports other people of the Pacific who are often lumped in as anything that looks kind of Pacific becomes Hawaiian, right? Like Moana is like this Hawaiian movie, yeah. right? Even though there's very little in the film, I mean, there's very little reality in the film, period. <laughs> um, but to me, when I watch it, it's much more an attempt at like this Tongan, like this other Pacific story, right? So I think undoing that that image of what Hawaii is to us and the way we talk about it and the way we think about it and the way we uh, fantasize about it in the simplest terms um, can be quite powerful. Especially as Hawaii sits in the Pacific, in, in the, and Hawaii not specifically, but other places like the Marshalls um, that, are, that are already being incredibly impacted by climate change, yeah. right? Both because of economic reasons and just because of geographic reasons, right? That we are feeling the effects of climate change before um, most people in the world and that's gonna be, become this, this is the immediate struggle of our time. And all the ways that we can come to really re-see the Pacific and its vibrant diversity um, and what it can offer to us, I think uh, can be incredibly powerful. So I just got to add something there because that, I was going to mention Moana, oh. and that just seems like it's really uh, it's uh, innocuous, you know, and it's just it's just an animated film, right? I get that a lot from my students, um, uh, and it's quite insidious uh, because of its disavowal of colonialism, right? And it's reaching to a pre, you know, pristine past, right? <laughs> Idyllic past. <laughs> um, so like like I could get my students to climate change. And like they get it, but when you take them to Moana, it's like cognitive dissonance, mm -hmm. right? Just kicks in. Entertainment. And it's, you know, don't, mm -hmm. that's sacred. Don't come at Disney. <laughs> don't come at Disney. Don't come at Disney. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for your uh, presentations. Uh, really, really fantastic. Um, I just, I have a comment and the uh, question. The, the comment is uh, that, um, it was, it's 
a revelation to me, some of the things that you're saying, uh, the cultural things, because as a Filipino, you know, that we also don't have gender. You don't think about gender when using pronouns. Mm -hmm. There's no, no word like that. And mm -hmm. similarly, you know, um, uh, you know we, we talk a lot relationally. Mm. So you're always conscious about relationship. The, the, the exact same words that you mentioned for we, mm -hmm. tayo, kami, sila, you know, they're all always relational. And uh, that sort of concept of reciprocity is so, so very important. And, um, you know, Tina, I mean, they, the, the, the word for, uh, in Tagalog, for brother, sister, th there's no gender for that. Mm -hmm. Kapatid yep. is, is about the umbilical cord. And um, you know, I, I believe that that practice also was, uh, you know, prevalent in the pre-Hispanic Philippines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, that's my comment. That I, I, I'm very happy to to hear about that. These kinds of connections. Yeah. Um, having said that, I, I, I think you know your presentations. I focus in on a couple of the historical things that you both raised. Um, and maybe just ask you to maybe sort of push it to, to think about what those mean in terms of gender and sexuality and um, you know an empire perhaps mm. um, you had raised the the point about bef you know how the missionaries uh, like before their arrival there is this a much different conception much broader range of um, mm relationships of intimacy and relationships, mm -hmm. gender relationships, <coughs> sexual relationships in Hawaii during this this time. And yet we're in a, this sort of post-colonial, neo-colonial moment in which these are the, the imposition of these binaries are about especially monogamy, mm -hmm. marriage, and so mm -hmm. forth. I guess I just want to know what does that mean in terms of to really understand that and to think about not just the historical but also the contemporary yeah. situation, what does that mean in the in the broader sense? You know, and I also add in, ter uh, in terms of the the burying of the placenta or the, uh, the umbilical cord. What does that mean uh, to to recognize those those practices in terms of the larger project of demilitarization? You know, in 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 Wuhan, you know, um, and and other not only that, but I guess other sort of traditional practices and 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 keeping those alive. Yeah, um, this is something I th think about a lot, so I should have a short answer to, but I don't. Um, I, I'm going to say a few things that might get me in trouble. That's cool. It's being recorded. It's awesome. Uh, the first thing is, as an intellectual Hawaiian, contemporary intellectual Hawaiian community, we know very little, if at all, about um, Hawaiian senses of gender and sex. Um, I myself don't know if kane and wahine, which are our words for like man and woman, I guess. Um, I don't know if those are genders. I don't know if those are sexes. I don't know if it's something else entirely. Nobody's written about this in a contemporary sense. Nobody's researched it. We don't know anything about it, um, which is both an opportunity, but also like at the very basic level, it makes it complicated for us to talk about gender and sexuality contemporarily in terms of decolonization. Um, we have this word mahu. People have probably heard it before. Contemporarily, mahu has been a really useful term for trans folks, mostly. Um, um, mostly used these days by trans women um, in Hawaii to both co to collectively identify but also culturally identify. Um, it's a really powerful term that has, I'm sure, an incredible vibrant history, but also I will say we know very little, if at all, about mahu historically. We know that they exist in Mo'olalo, we see the word in Mo'olalo, but no one has done an extensive study of what that means. Um, but oftentimes when people want to talk to me about gender and sexuality, they ask me, oh, can we talk about mahu? And I have to tell them I don't know what that is. I mean, I know what it is, but I don't know what it is in the way that I know about ikane and these other relationships, um, which also poses another problem because these are words we use because of our contemporary situation and our need for community 
um, living in this very like colonial situation in Hawaii, right? This and this these homophobic institutions that have distanced us from our own families, we've had to create new ohana for us to exist. And so we have to start identifying as queer or gay or lesbian, even though those aren't really Maoli, indigenous ways of thinking about practices of sex and desire. And so this is where things get, for me, really complicated because I've never in my life identified with my sexuality. Um, mostly because I kind of got the jackpot of parents and that I didn't need to create new community. I, I had existing community. Um, and my, I came to understand at some point my queerness as Hawaiian-ness. And to me, that's, that's the important work that needs to happen in Hawaii without disavowing the important space that queer communities create for people who have been displaced from ohana and place and are traumatized and violated. Uh, by colonialism or whatever whatever ism you want to call it, um, obviously queer spaces are necessary in this moment. Um, but it is also my hope that it's just this moment that that um, displacement from our ohana is necessary. In 2013 or 2014, the state of Hawaii was um, debating whether or not same-sex marriage should be legal. Uh, and a group of Hawaiian leaders, leaders came together to make uh, a short commercial where they said, and one of them at the time was the chair of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, um, and she said same-sex marriage would violate traditional notions of ohana and aloha. Um, and it's just all Hawaiians standing in front of you, like some of them are cops, some of them are like leaders in our community, again, leaders. Um, and what was really disturbing about that piece to me was that she misunderstood, one, she had no sense of history, right? To say that, she obviously had no sense of history. But two, what she should have said is marriage violates traditional notions of ohana and aloha, right? Like she had a great opportunity to say the problem here is like, let's just forget this marriage thing. Um, but that's what creates this conditions for the need for, uh, in this contemporary situation. So when I think about the value or why I do the work that I do, I guess, and I'm not sure if I'm even still answering your question, but when I think about the value of Mo'olelo and this particular work is that it offers us mirrors into the past. Uh, and it offers me as, and I, although I don't identify as queer, I use the word to identify myself so, peop, so I'm legible, right? So me as a queer Hawaiian woman uh, can look into my Mo'olelo and see that I am fully Hawaiian and that there's, that there is an understanding for why I love the way that I love and why I feel the way that I feel. Um, and that that can be kind of the medicine to heal our ohana. Um, and I see it every day when I tell these stories to young people, to, to people my age, to older people, when they start to make these connections and they understand, oh, this is why my family is this way. Um, and then we have the whole other side is all these other scars of having these things pulled out of our ohana. I think um, <clears throat> with, with uh, the question about uh, what can, you know, the burying of the placenta do in, in terms of uh, uh, decolonial, right, decolonization, uh, it's, it's that embodied, how embodied it is, right? Uh, I mean, when you hear people say, you know, when they, when they say, well, my placenta was buried there. Mm. I, I, I could have spent 20 years here of my life here, but that, that my placenta is there gives me a deeper obligation, mm -hmm. you know, to that place. Um, and I think that it's something that's happening now, you know, 20 years ago, you didn't see people taking home their placentas. And I know that that, that was something that started actually because of Hawaii, that they, you know, um, um, they were the first state to actually make it legal to bring home your placenta. And um, so now you're seeing those numbers rise. So I think in Guam, people taking home their placentas and burying them, mm -hmm. you know, under a tree or, uh, so it's that really, for lack of a better phrase, that shit runs deep, right? Yes. <laughs> um, I just wanna thank you both for coming here and sharing your manal, your, your ideas and your, your um, powerful work with us. Thank yeah, you so much. Deep. Thank you.